so that one root of the equation x cubed plus x squared minus 3 is equal to 0 lies between x is equal to 1 and x is equal to 2. Then you'll be told to use Newton Raphson method to, to determine the value of, of that of that root, isn't it? So you use Newton Raphson method to determine the value of that root. So you'll be told to show that one root lies between one and two. So for you to show that the root of a function lies between a certain range, the first thing you need to know that for a root of a function to exist, when you substitute that root with the function, you are supposed to get zero, isn't it? Meaning f of x must be you must get a zero, meaning when the value of x is the root, isn't it? So x is the root of the function is if f of x is equal to 0. Are we together? So the equation you'll be told x cubed plus x squared minus 3 is equal to 0. So it means the root of this equation exists if the function is equal to 0, isn't it? So if the function is equal to 0 and this equation is equal to 0, so it means the two are equal. So you can get the function of that equation, isn't it? So what is the function here? If you equate the two, you get f of x is equal to x cubed plus x squared minus 3, isn't it? So you found the function from the equation. Meaning you can only get the function from the equation if it is equal to zero. Meaning that if there is not zero here, you remove what is there you bring on the left hand side of the equation until you get a zero. It's when you'll be able to see the function, isn't it? Are we together? So once we found the function, for you to show that, remember, when the value of the function is equal to zero, then x is the root, isn't it? So they are telling you for you to show that the root lies between x is equal to 1 and 2. You substitute this x is equal to 1 and x is equal to 2 to see the range. To see is 0 lying in that interval. Because the solution of this function is supposed to be 0. If it's when x is the root, isn't it? So if you get the value 0 must be between the interval x is equal to 1 and 2. You check if the value of that function 0 is between that given interval. You see? So let us start. When x is equal to 1, what does this imply? What is f of 1? What is f of 1? Where there is x, you put 1. What is f of 1? Are you getting it? When x is equal to 1, what will be f of x? Meaning, where there is x, you put 1. So what do you get? 1 cubed plus 1 squared minus 3. Isn't it? Are we together? What do you get? Negative? Because 1 cube is just 1, 1 squared is just 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 minus 3 is negative 1, isn't it? Then you go to the last one, when x is 2, what is the value of y when x is 2? Remember f of x, if y is a function of x, it's like y is equal to f of x, so it means coordinate, when you have x value, you get the y value, isn't it? Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Meaning if this f of x is y, meaning you are saying y is equal to x2 plus x squared minus 3, so when x is 1, what is y? Are you seeing that? When x is 2, what is y? Are you getting the point? Good. So, when x is 2, what is the value? Where there is x, you put 2. When x is 2, where there is x, you put 2. 2 cubed plus 2 squared minus 3. You get 5, isn't it? Because this is 8 plus 2 is 8. 8 plus 4 is 12. It is not 5. Have you used the calculator? It cannot be that. 2 cubed is 8. Plus that. You, you get 9. Are you using the calculator? Are you using the calculator? You get 9. So, when are you supposed to get the root of the function? You are supposed to get the root of the function. The value of this function must be equal to 0, isn't it? Are you saying that? So, you are seeing. 0 lies in the interval from negative 1 to 9. Are you seeing? Are we together? So 0, f of x should be equal to 0 is when x is the root. Are you getting? So you say 0 is in the 0 is in the interval from 1 to 9. 0 is in that interval. Because 0 is between negative 1 and 9. So if 0 which is the root of this function, if 0 
is what gives you the root of this function. When this function is close to zero is when you get the root, then that zero you can see it is between this interval. Are we together? So when it is between that interval, it means the root lies between one and two. There's a root there. Are you getting the point? The root lies between one and one and two. Because the value of the function, the value, the value of the function at one is negative one. And the value of the function at two is nine. But the value of the function is zero at the root. Are you seeing? And you can see zero, you are now seeing here, f of one is equal to, you found is equal to negative one, then f of x, where the root is, is equal to zero, then f of two is equal to nine. So you can see zero is between negative one and nine. And this when the function is zero is when x is the root. Are you seeing? Yes. So we are saying the root lies between, between one and two because at one you get negative one at two you get nine but you are supposed to get zero at the root are you getting are we together yes. so you can see zero is between negative one and and nine so if zero is between negative one and nine it means the root is between is between the value when x is one is between one and two so here x is one here x is two meaning the root is a value which is between one and two meaning it will be a value of x like one point something are you seeing are you getting the point Maybe the root can be 1.2, 1.3, 1.2, anything because it is between 1 and 2. It cannot be outside 1, it cannot be outside 2. Umelewa? Yes. Yes, because at the point when x is 1, when x is 2, so this x value must be a value between 1 point something and it does not pass 2, isn't it? Is that okay? Good. So we've actually shown that the root of one of the root of this equation because when it is x cubed it is very possible that you have three roots but sometimes because of the perfect roots because you may get a root mean square when you have a problem like x plus y square is equal to z so it means it is sporadic but we have one root because it is perfect isn't it so it means the number of roots you can get when it is cubed is three so if there is any case of a perfect then three is the maximum isn't it and that one of them will prove that it is in that range. Okay? So after proving that one of the root lies in that interval, the next thing is to do is to get that root, isn't it? Yes. Are we together? Yes. Is to get that root. So how do we get that root? We start with the function. We've already found the function, isn't it? Yes. So what did we find the function to be? F of x we found is x cubed plus x squared minus. 3, that is the function, isn't it? Yes. Then we differentiate that, the function. So if we differentiate f of x, you get f prime of? f prime of x, isn't it? So start differentiating. If you differentiate x cubed, you get? 3x squared. 3x squared. Then if you differentiate x squared? Plus 2x. Plus 2x. If you differentiate a constant? You get 0, isn't it? Yes. So from there, this is f of x. You put your n, f of x, n x cubed, xn cubed, xn squared in that one. f prime of xn, where there is x, you put there, you substitute with the xn. So we have the function f of xn and f prime of xn. Are we together? So after that, you put the Newton Rapsons formula. So what is the Newton Rapsons formula? xn plus 1 is equal to xn minus, you have your function f of x. Then over you differentiate it, you get f prime of x, then you put your n there. f of x n divided by f prime of x n, isn't it? Yes. Are we together? Use the LCM. What do you get? You put this on one when you want to give with the LCM, isn't it? So the LCM is the product of the two you get. f prime of x n. Then you cross multiply like this times this, you get x n f prime of x and then minus the name. Ah yeah. With this times this, f of, are we together? Yes. So we have cross multiply this times this, you get this, then we have minus in between them, this times this, you get that, then over this times that, you get that, isn't it? Is that okay? Yes. So the next thing you do is to substitute. So what do we have? We have our xn plus 1 is supposed to what? xn times f f prime of x n. So what is your f prime of x n? 3 x n squared plus 2 x n. You 
you must put it in bracket to show that the whole of it is f prime of x n. Look at it. Then it is minus f of x n. What is your f of x n? x n cube plus x n squared minus 3. Then everything is over. Everything is over. F prime of f prime of x n, isn't it? Which is 3 x n squared. 3 x n squared plus 2 x n. Then you open the bracket, isn't it? together. Yes. Good. So open the bracket, you have xn times xn squared, you get 3xn cubed, isn't it? Then we have your plus there, plus 2xn times xn, xn squared. Are we together? Open this other bracket, negative affects everything inside the bracket, isn't it? I have negative times xn cubed, you get negative xn cubed, isn't it? I am negative into positive, negative x n squared, isn't it? You move negative into negative, positive 3. You are done with that, with the numerator. Go to the denominator, 3xn, 3xn squared plus 2xn. So the next step is just to simplify. Remember on the right hand side of the equation we have our xn plus 1, isn't it? To be equals to, so start. This is x and q, this is x and q, meaning you join them, isn't it? So this is positive 3 and negative 1. What do you get? Positive 3 and negative 1, you get 2, isn't it? Yes. Are we together? So that is 2xn, 2x and q, you join those, isn't it? Then you go here, we have xn squared, this one is also x and q. So you check, this is positive 2, this is negative 1, isn't it? So positive 2 and negative 1, what do you get? Positive 1, isn't it? Yes. So you have positive 1 x n squared, but 1 is only silent, isn't it? Then the last one, only positive 3 is left, isn't it? Then it is plus, plus 3. Then it is over. When it is over, 3 x n squared plus 2 x n. Then now, where there is x n, you put the answer, isn't it? Where there is x n, you put the, the answer. So here we are, x n plus 1 is equal to 2 answer, 2 answer cubed plus answer squared, isn't it? Plus answer squared plus, plus 3. Then it is over. Denominator x n is answer, that is 3 answer squared, isn't it? 3 answer squared plus 2 answer. So where does x n you substitute the answer? So the answer will be the first iteration, isn't it? Now what is your x naught? You've not been told x naught. Why? Because you've been told to show that the root lies between x is equal to 1 and x is equal to 2. Many they are trying to tell you that choose x naught to be any value between 1 and 2. That is what they are saying. Are you getting the point? For the root to lie between the interval 1 and 2, meaning the value of x must be between 1 and 2. So you choose any value between 1 and 2. Between 1 and 2. Which of course you can choose a value like 1.5. It's between 1 and 2, isn't it? 1.2. It's between 1 and 2. So I do always prefer that you choose the value in the middle because you don't know which one will be close to it, isn't it? Because when you choose the value at 1, if you choose 1, you don't know whether it was close to 1.9. Because that means you'll be doing a lot of iterations, isn't it? If you choose 1.9, you don't know whether it was close to 1.0. So you'll be doing a lot of iterations, isn't it? But if you choose the value in the middle, it means you'll be doing few iterations to reach it. Because you don't know where it is. Are you getting the point? Are we together? Because when you choose a value in the middle, it means you'll be reaching, mid mid reaching midway to get if it was close here. If you choose a value in the middle, it means you'll be moving midway to reach if it was close this side, doesn't it? But if you choose a value close to 2 and it was here, see, you will be doing a lot of iterations. Are you trying to get my reason in? Yes. It is always recommended to choose the value in the middle because you don't know where that root lies in that range. Okay? To minimize the number of iterations you are going to, to perform. So, 
the room must be between 1 and 2, like 1.5. So when where there is x, if you put 1, we got negative 1. Where there is x, if we put 2, we got 9. So it means we were supposed to get 0, but we got negative 1 and 9, meaning 0 is between negative 1 and 9. That was the implication of proving that the root is between, is between 1 and 2. So when you are choosing x naught, choose a value midway between 1 and 2. And that is the average 1 plus 2 divided by 2. Too many choosing 1.5 is very convenient, isn't it? Yes. But you can choose anything. You can even choose 1.1. 1 .1. You can even choose 1.0, isn't it? Yes. You can even choose 2.0. You can even choose 1.9. But we don't need those because we don't know where it is. So you choose the midway. Okay? Yes. 1.5. So go to the calculator and you press x naught is equal to our first choice x naught is one point so one point five is equal to one point five you press that isn't it then who press an AC button and fit the formula numerator over denominator so in the numerator is two as a cube if you're using the other calculator just put the bracket for the numerator then you have your two answer raised to power three then plus answer is answer is to power 2 plus plus 3 then you close the bracket of the numerator then it is divided by you open the bracket of the denominator 3 answer is to power 2 then plus 2 answer that one if you are using the other calculator but if you are using the recommended calculator you simply go and press the fraction key over that, isn't it? Then you feed the numerator. So the numerator you put two answer, then you press the button for power. Then in the power you put the power which is there, three. So you don't press anything, you must press the forward button to move down here. If you don't press the forward button, it means you'll be feeding the next thing on top there. Are you see? So you do that, then you press, it is plus answer square. You press the key for power, you put your two there, then you press the forward button in the replay there. The replay keys to move forward. Then it is minus, no, it is plus three. You are done with the numerator. Then you press the scroll down a button to take you in the denominator. Are we together? Have you done that? The number of decimal places were not saying. So if you are not told the number of decimal places, you choose, isn't it? Even all the small places is always convenient if you are not told, isn't it? Are we together? Yes. So, did you fix the number of the small places? Yes. So, how many have you fixed? You fixed four. You can fix five or six. How many have you fixed? Six. How many have you fixed? Four. So, whichever, whatever you are fixing is your own choice. Because you don't be told, isn't it? Yes. Good. So, after doing that, what have we found? If you press equal side, what do you get? 1.865385 So I said you don't record that value of x1 before you confirm it, isn't it? Are we together? So you said you press equal side, you found 1 point? So, are you saying, yeah, whether you found the 1.86, there is no problem Are you saying that is the reason why I am saying you have to confirm twice? Meaning when you are confirming it, you do again, you just press a C button. That's not interfere with the formula, just minimize it, isn't it? Then you press your value again. 1.5 is equal to 1.5. Then you replay with that upper, upper. You replay, you replay to go back to the formula. Are you seeing? When you replay, you get the value, then you press is equal to what? Are you seeing that? 1.86, meaning your formula is wrong. Here I can see you first go answer Q answer square. There is no sign between them. Where is the sign? See, there is an addition of sign between here. What, what have you found? 1.2308. 1 1.2308. 1 you are working with four decimal places. Yes. Is that what we have there at the back? What have you found in your case? Uh, remember the sign I'm seeing there, everything is plus. It is plus everywhere. This is 3 and negative 1. Very easy. 2 that is okay. 
This is positive 2 and negative 1. Very positive. Yes. So you have the same thing. 1.2, 3, 0, 8. eight. What do you have with your decimal places you place? Uh -huh. Yes, it's equal to. So, a C button, yes, you confirm it. So, press a C button to do it for the second time. 1.5 is equal to 1.5. Yeah, to confirm, if it is the same thing, you have to confirm twice, isn't it? Because it is that value which is going to affect all the values here, isn't it? You have to confirm twice. Is equal to that, then you replace the calculator to get the back the formula. No, 1.5 is equal to 1.5. So you simply replace the number that you see that your formula. Then you press equal signs again. Then that means you confirm it. It's giving the same time. Okay. Are you see? You have to confirm it twice. It's when you will be sudden that. That is the right thing. So if it is the right thing, you now continue pressing equal sign to generate the others, isn't it? Yes. Are we together? So if you press equal sign again, what is x2? 1.1767. 1767. Six, seven. Six, seven. Then if you press equal sign again. 1.1? 1. 1. 1. 746. Seven, then if you press equal sign again. 1.174? Have you seen you read there? So you see the reason why I'm saying starting at the midway 1.5 is very convenient. So what about if somebody started at 1.9? It means you are going to have more iteration. But at the end, all of you are going to get the same value at the end, isn't it? So to ensure that you reduce the number of iteration, it is good to start with the value in the menu, isn't it? Are we together? Yes. Good. So the value has repeated itself, meaning it has suffices at that point. So it means the solution of x, the root of this equation is the value of x which is giving you zero, isn't it? And that value of x which is giving you zero is 1.174 for 6 if you are dealing with four decimal places, isn't it? So that implies that our x value is 1.1746. So that is the end of Newton Absorbs method. In the next class, we are dealing with new numerical methods of integration. The trapezoidal rule, the main ordinate rule, and the Simpsons rule.